students. Um, once again, Dr. O'Malley is uh, lecturing uh, for uh, the, <coughs> uh, for actually the fourth time on uh, uh, 20th century Irish uh, history. Uh, the lecture today will focus on the Cosgrave years 1922 to 1939. And while you will not see on this uh, screen, this YouTube, the, uh, uh, my, com my, my presentation accompanied by uh, the Cosgrave years 1922-32 uh, PowerPoint, you can, we should be able to access the PowerPoint going into uh, Sakai. It's posted there. Now, your assignments <clears throat> for the uh, uh, March 30th, April 2nd, April 30th, uh, April 3rd year, uh, the Cosgrave years, uh, is to produce a detailed two-page outline of Gibney, pages, uh, um, actually, let's go with pages 203 to 212, 203 to 212. Then you will uh, produce a thoughtful half-page outline of the PowerPoint, uh, uh, which I just uh, referenced, on the uh, Cosgrave years, 1922-1932. And then th thirdly, you will produce a thoughtful one-page response to the following question. To what extent did the Cosgrave administration create a stable and enduring uh, independent Irish Free State uh, in the 1922-1932 period. Again, to what extent did the Cosgrave uh, government administration create a stable and enduring independent uh, Irish free state uh, in the 1922-1932 period? Uh, I might also uh, ask you whether you are uh, uh, ready to submit um, the assignments uh, for week 10 and uh, week 11. What we're discussing today are the assignments for week 12. Now, one of uh, you uh, has been most prompt in fulfilling assignments um, just after I, my, my uh, YouTube uh, presentation. Um, uh, the rest of you have not, um, but that's okay, except um, you shouldn't let uh, the assignments drift uh, because they'll all come due, if you will, uh, uh, at once, because uh, the uh, semester uh, will pass uh, more rapidly than we, we expect it to at this point. Again, you are all uh, aware that uh, we will uh, be teaching uh, online uh, in this course until the very end of the term. These, the college has extended uh, the uh, remote uh, presentation of courses right to the very end of the term. Uh, something else. Um, as uh, <clears throat> your assignment, you, you recognize, uh, um, it shows uh, next week's, uh, actually not next week, but the following week's uh, assignments to center around uh, Ernie O'Malley's 
uh, on another man's wound. I want to know from each of you whether you have access to Journey O'Malley's memoir on another man's wound. It's extremely important that you uh, email me uh, indicating that you have or do not have access to that book. Likewise, I want you to uh, email me and indicate whether you have uh, uh, access to Henry Patterson's Ireland since 1939. Um, and uh, uh, that information also is going to be invaluable if, uh, uh, so please let me know. As I plot our way forward, as I craft what you know are reasonable uh, assignments uh, for uh, fulfilling successfully uh, the course. Now, let's get to the matter uh, uh, at hand. Uh, the Cosgrave years, uh, you know from the packet uh, that I uh, sent you that I uh, sent uh, a, uh, a, uh, an outline of uh, the uh, presentation that I will be following, it's entitled The Cosgrave Years, 1922-32. I also uh, sent along uh, some uh, um, supplementary material that will certainly be profitable uh, as you uh, craft uh, a uh, response to the third assignment for this uh, coming week. Now, uh, let's go uh, on to the, uh, uh, the uh, outline. Uh, I quote at the beginning, John Murphy's Ireland in the 20th Century, page 75. The coming of their Civil War enemies to power was a bitter pill for men like Cosgrave and Mulcahy. But for them there could be no question of interfering with the due process of parliamentary democracy. The 1932 a change of government was remarkable, not simply because it witnessed the resurgence of a group totally defeated a decade early, uh, er, in the Civil War, but because it demonstrated the political maturity and stability of the young state. So Murphy here is citing the peaceful transition uh, from the Cosgrave administration to the De Valera administration that took place at the beginning of 1932. It's a remarkable transition because it's peaceful. Uh, and I want you to keep uh, that in mind as we go through uh, some important points in the history of the Cosgrave decades, 32, uh, 22 to 32. Uh, I begin, uh, and you could certainly follow this on the outline, the uh, Irish uh, Free State. Uh, styled in uh, the Irish language, Sostat Erin, uh, came to, into existence officially on December 6, 1922. Uh, the, um, it, it came into existence under a constitution. It's basically the first constitution of the Irish Free State, 1922 constitution. Uh, in that constitution, the government of the Irish Free State was uh, entrusted to the uh, Reactus, uh, two bodies, Doyle Aaron and Senate Aaron, the Doyle and the Senate, uh, which met at Leinster House, Leinster House, 
uh, where the Doyle uh, of uh, the Irish Republic to this day uh, meets uh, in session. Uh, Lenstown's. By the way, little little digression here. Our American White House, which was designed uh, by uh, an Irish-born architect, James Hoban. Leinster House uh, is the model for our um, uh, White House. Little, uh, little detail there. Now, the Constitution uh, was meant to give force to the Treaty of uh, December uh, of 1921. Uh, uh, and what did the Constitution of 1922 provide? Uh, it set up uh, uh, the uh, Irish Free State uh, as a, uh, in Articles 1 and 2, as a co-equal member of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Uh, the Constitution asserted that all governmental powers and authority uh, derived primarily from the Irish people. Article 17 of that Constitution uh, contained uh, the controversial uh, requirement that members of the Senate uh, and the Doyle would uh, take an oath of allegiance to the British Crown, 1922, in other words, to uh, the reigning uh, monarch uh, of uh, Britain, uh, George uh, uh, V. The uh, Constitution uh, that constitutional uh, requirement of, uh, to take the oath uh, did not set well with De Valera and his Republican supporters uh, as members of the Doyle. They refused to take the oath. Uh, they also objected to the new constitution because it essentially ratified the uh, the Treaty of December 6, uh, 1921. Uh, the failure of the uh, Sinn Féin, uh, anti-treaty Sinn Féin, was under De Valera to take the, uh, take the oath and take their city, uh, seats in the uh, Doyle, meant uh, that the Tropeedy uh, uh, Party under William Cosgrave uh, would uh, uh, become uh, the governmental uh, party of the Irish Free State. Um, it should be noted that the Doyle, which had already been uh, 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 constituted, uh, uh, for the first time now was was reconvened uh, under the new constitution uh, December 12, 1922 uh, with Tim Healy, the uh, governor uh, general uh, reading the address from the king. I'm going to show the, let's show the uh, email, uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, uh, if you would just bear with me for a minute, we're trying to post, uh, in my view, the um, uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, for the Cosgrave years. Um, the uh, 
it uh, there it is there it is okay uh, the uh, uh, before I describe uh, what I'm seeing here what you'll see when you go into that PowerPoint uh, uh, I want to uh, discuss what followed the uh, reconvening of the Doyle under the new Constitution, December 12, 1922, with uh, Tim Healy uh, reading the address from the uh, king. He's the governor general, he's a former home rule uh, leader, uh, and he uh, is pro, pro treaty, obviously. Um, the as, you, as you, your outline indicates, the Sinn Féin organization uh, had been shattered by the treaty issue. And in January of 1923, a convention of treaty supporters, in other words, pro-treaty Sinn Féiners, uh, drew up a program um, uh, in other words, they cease to call their party uh, pro-treaty Sinn Féin. Rather, uh, in April of 1923, uh, they launched uh, Kuman Nagail. Kuman Nagail. Uh, that is to say, uh, the uh, party uh, of uh, the organization of the Gales. Uh, that uh, organization, which was essentially pro-treaty Sinn Féin, uh, pledged to build a new island on the basis of the new constitution, the 1922 constitution. Um, and the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the first general election under that constitution uh, taking place uh, later in uh, 1923, August 23. Um, the, um, uh, who, uh, what, were the, uh, what was the outcome of that first general election? Sinn Féin won uh, 44 seats. Essentially, De Valera's anti treaty party, 44 seats. There were 16 independents, 15 members of the Farmers Party, 14 of the Labor Party. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, you might ask, well, what about the pro treaty party, Cosgrave's party, Commander Gale? They won 63 uh, uh, seats. And given the absence of uh, De Valera's uh, party uh, deputies, Commander Gale had a safe majority uh, in the uh, uh, election, uh, uh, in the selection of the executive. Uh, the uh, uh, official opposition party uh, came to be uh, the Irish Labour Party. Now, uh, your first uh, frame in the PowerPoint shows uh, uh, Cosgrave uh, and several of his uh, key ministers. Uh, the new government uh, had Cosgrave as president of the Executive Council. Kevin O'Higgins, note that name, very important. He's vice president and minister for home affairs uh, Richard Mulcahy, Minister of Defense, uh, Desmond Fitzgerald, Minister for External Affairs. I, I guess they, you might call me uh, equivalent of a Secretary of State. Joe McGrath, Ministry of uh, Industry and uh, Commerce. Owen uh, McNeil, the scholar revolutionary who had been a great uh, historian of early Irish history and of the Irish language, founder of the Gaelic League, uh, 
with Douglas Hyde, uh, Owen McKeel as Minister for Education, and finally uh, Ernest Blythe uh, was the uh, only uh, Protestant uh, in uh, the uh, cabinet. Uh, interestingly enough, he's Minister of Finance and he has, uh, he's an Ulster Protestant. Now, what are the issues that uh, uh, the new, uh, uh, the government under the new, uh, the Treaty of 1922 had to deal with? Was, uh, as you know from my, my discussion of the Civil War, uh, law and order. Um, and whose responsibility was maintaining <coughs> law and order in the cabinet? It was Kevin O'Neill. Uh, Kevin, uh, excuse me, O'Higgins, Kevin O'Higgins, uh, uh, as a vice uh, uh, <clears throat> a president uh, of the uh, new government and minister for home affairs, home affairs, in other words, sec internal security. Uh, he uh, uh, created an unarmed uh, police force uh, that... Uh, uh, would be called the Civic Guard, and later on the Irish name would be Garda uh, Sicona. Um, uh, under his uh, auspices uh, uh, and others in the uh, administration, courts of law were set up. Um, 1924, there was a court uh, of uh, a Justice Act. Uh, Okay, um, I'm looking at, by the way, the uh, uh, frame that uh, has uh, portraits of Thomas Johnson, Cattell O'Shannon. Johnson was head of the Labor Party. His chief deputy was Cattell O'Shannon. Uh, Johnson had an interesting <laughs> life story. He wasn't even Irish. He was born in Liverpool, uh, and uh, but he was the head of the official opposition uh, to the Kuman Nagayo government of, uh, of uh, Cosgrave. Uh, now, the Courts of Justice Act retained uh, the common law, in other words, basically English common law. Uh, under it, uh, justice was quicker and less costly. 1923 also saw the uh, passage of a Public Safety Act uh, that gave O'Higgins power to intern without trial any prisoners the government considered uh, a danger uh, to a public peace uh, uh, or uh, uh, order. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, by the time uh, it uh, would be enacted and applied, <clears throat> um, the uh, general election of August of uh, 1923 had, uh, was taking place. Uh, and uh, under this Public Safety Act of uh, 1923, De Valera, would be interned, uh, for, as it turned out, for almost a year, August 15th, 1923 to July of 1924. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, under the uh, provisions of the uh, Act, uh, uh, there, there, there were uh, really thousands uh, uh, who were gradually freed. Uh, from internment. As we move on, uh, again under the law and order uh, 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 topic, 1924. 1924 uh, saw the uh, good uh, army, so-called army mutiny of 1924. Uh, it uh, raised the, uh, centered around the problem for any young state, and certainly this young state. Uh, the question is always, 
you know, a revolutionary movement succeeds, force is used to, to uh, have reached that goal. The question is, what would happen to the revolutionary army? Uh, and in the case of the Cosgrave government, uh, the, that question uh, loomed large at, uh, you know, in 1923, and especially in 1924. Would the uh, army, uh, the national army, be loyal? Would it follow the dictates of the civilian government? Um, that test came in 1924. Now, uh, as 1924 uh, opened, there were approximately 60,000 men in the National Army. It was totally uh, uh, excessive for a state the size of the Irish Free State. Uh, and it, it's unbelievably expensive to maintain it. So in March of 1924, uh, the government uh, uh, issued an order to demobilize. In other words, let go 2,000 officers and 3,500 enlisted men. Now, that demobilization <coughs> was resented uh, by uh, a number of veterans of the old IRA, in other words, the IRA that had fought uh, uh, successfully against the British in 1921-1923. Uh, these uh, <coughs> veterans were troubled by the fact that uh, a number of the officers <coughs> and enlisted men who were being let go uh, were had fought uh, in the old IRA against the British <coughs> and they were being let go but some who had joined the National Army during the Civil War they were still being retained. <coughs> now it also galled those, uh, many of those who were being uh, uh, demobilized, that the, uh, uh, some of those who had come <coughs> into the National Army during the Civil War included many former British soldiers. Uh, also, <coughs> there were those in the old IRA who also resented the failure of the Free State to move to a republic. Uh, and thirdly, there was a resentment of the uh, domination of the Army Council uh, by the uh, Irish Republican Brotherhood. <coughs> How did the mutiny uh, get underway? What uh, course did it uh, follow? <coughs> March 6th. An ultimatum was signed by Liam Tobin and C.F. Dalton demanding an end to demobilization, removal of the Army Council, guarantee of the government's intention to, uh, to achieve the Irish Republic. The government acted promptly. Uh, the signatories of the ultimatum were, uh, were arrested. Uh, General Owen uh, O'Duffy um, uh, took charge uh, of the army. That's a picture of O'Duffy later on in the 1930s when he formed a, uh, uh, a uh, what should we say, a kind of paramilitary group uh, uh, that uh, we'll talk about uh, when we uh, chronicle the De Valera years. Uh, O'Duffy, O'Duffy. He had uh, been a general in the struggle against Britain. Uh, he was a key figure uh, uh, in the uh, the uh, uh, formation, the uh, 
the uh, uh, operation of the uh, national police force. Um, he's a very complex figure, Owen O'Duffy. Now, uh, in this mutiny, a number of officers deserted their post, but there was no shooting. Uh, it was prevented by the intervention of the Minister for uh, uh, Commerce and uh, uh, Industries, um, uh, the accountant, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Joseph McGrath. Joseph McGrath. You'll meet him again later on in the uh, Cosgrave years. Uh, Yes, the uh, mutiny never did result in violence. Uh, an agreement was reached. Uh, there was promised an inquiry into the administration of the army. Uh, existing members of the pro-IRB Army Council were replaced by more neutral officers. Uh, there was no punishment for officers who had devoted, uh, deserted their posts. And, and this is very important, uh, those who were demobilized uh, were promised, were guaranteed a pension, a pension for their service. Uh, it should be noted that during uh, the uh, mutiny uh, crisis um, of 24, uh, that uh, Kevin O'Higgins was a strong man. Cosgrave himself was ill. Uh, and so Cosgrave, through O'Higgins, insisted on the resignation of three senior officers uh, of the army. And the defense minister, Mulcahy, uh, had to resign. And I quote for you uh, O'Higgins, uh, the famous words on the occasion uh, of the uh, uh, conclusion uh, of the of the uh, on, on the uh, of the resolution uh, of uh, the uh, army mutiny in 1924. Uh, I declare. Those who take the pay and wear the uniform of the state, be they soldiers or police must be non-political servants of the state. Um, so, O'Higgins, strong man. 1924 was followed by uh, the crisis uh, that developed around the question of the Boundary uh, Commission. Um, now, you remember uh, by the by the way here uh, uh, I'm looking and, and next frame is the funeral of Arthur Griffith August 16 1922 uh, pictured here General Richard Mulcahy he's on the left and Mike Collins on the right um, next frame uh, here we are uh, at any rate, <clears throat> at any rate uh, the Boundary Committee, I refresh your, your memory, there was a provision in the treaty, Articles uh, 11 and 12, <clears throat> that if the Northern Ireland government opted out of the Irish Free State, then a Boundary Commission would be set up uh, to uh, settle once and for all uh, the uh, boundary, in other words, define what was the permanent boundary between the Irish Free State uh, and the uh, Northern and Northern Ireland. Uh, that boundary commission, which was supposed to be set up fairly uh, rapidly, <clears throat> was not. Uh, there were complications. Uh, for example, uh, the Civil War was in progress uh, when the Free State officially came into existence, December 6, 1922. <clears throat> uh, and of course, December 7, 1922, Northern Ireland opted out uh, <clears throat> of the Free State. 
And then there was a political instability in England from 1922 to 1924 <coughs> uh, in the uh, general election in the uh, United Kingdom. Lloyd George's government fell in 1922. Uh, the conservative governments, uh, uh, conservative government under Bonaloa and Baldwin followed but then, uh, in the 1923 general uh, election, a Labour government uh, was uh, uh, returned to power. First time uh, under uh, McDonald. McDonald. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, so there's turbulence electorally, politically, in the, in the government of the United Kingdom. And also, the Northern Ireland government did not want to uh, see uh, a, a Boundary Commission form. They feared that a Boundary Commission uh, might uh, whittle away a part of uh, Northern Ireland, transfer uh, sizable parts of uh, the territory of the six counties to the Irish Free State. Uh, however, uh, with the uh, um, replacement of the short-lived Ramsey uh, MacDonald uh, Labour government uh, with the Conservative government of uh, of uh, Stanley Baldwin, uh, we have in October of 1924, uh, Cosgrave, president of the uh, Irish Free State Executive, uh, and Baldwin, the uh, Prime Minister of the uh, UK, they agreed uh, to uh, set up uh, a Boundary Commission. Uh, who are the members of the Commission? Representing uh, the Irish Free State uh, is uh, Dr. Owen MacNeill, Minister for uh, Education, the great uh, Irish uh, scholar of the language and early Irish history, Owen MacNeill. Uh, representing uh, the Northern Ireland government uh, was J.R. Fisher. And then uh, the Boundary Commission was supposed to have a neutral, a neutral uh, leader appointed by the British government. Uh, he was uh, Judge uh, Justice Feetham from South Africa, South Africa. Now, the Commission spent most of 1925 gathering data. Uh, all three of the Commissioners um, uh, agreed to sign a report uh, approved by two of them. Uh, as the uh, Commissioners uh, did their job, uh, Speculation was rife that some of uh, that several of the uh, uh, six counties that had a sizable uh, Catholic populations, counties Tyrone and Fermanagh, uh, that some uh, parts of those uh, counties would be uh, transferred to the Free State. But as it turned out, nothing of that sort was uh, uh, in the works. Indeed, in the conservative newspaper, uh, the Morning Post, British newspaper, of November 7, uh, 1925, um, the... Um, um, the uh, 
the November 7, 1925, it was leaked that the commission would leave the border pretty much as before. Uh, there would be some uh, changes, though, some part of uh, Protestant areas of County Donegal would be transferred from the Free State to Northern Ireland, and uh, relatively small parts uh, of South Armagh and South Fermanagh would be transferred to the uh, Free State. Uh, now, the point is, the uh, uh, judgment, uh, or the report of the committee, uh, which was about to be uh, approved by Feetham and Fisher, uh, was not going to re return uh, uh, a judgment uh, that would uh, significantly uh, diminish the uh, size of Northern Ireland. <coughs> now, once that uh, report in the Morning Post, November 7, 1925, was released, uh, there was an immediate outcry. Uh, McNeil resigned uh, rather than uh, support uh, the report, uh, and a tripartite agreement was hurriedly arranged. Why was it a tripartite agreement? Uh, because the leadership, Craig uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, Baldwin, the UK Prime Minister, Cosgrave, the uh, uh, head of the Free State, uh, they uh, put together a, uh, an agreement that uh, the, uh, the border would not be changed from what it was before the Boundary Committee uh, Commission uh, was established. Uh, there was some sweeteners in the agreement. The Free State was released from obligations uh, for paying part of the United Kingdom public debt, uh, but the Northern Ireland government uh, uh, was uh, satisfied uh, by <clears throat> the uh, uh, provision in the agreement that the powers uh, of any uh, Council of Ireland relating to the Northern Ireland government uh, would not be installed. Um, what was the imp impact of the tripartite uh, agreement? Um, and, and the failure of the Boundary Commission to deliver. Um, in the Free State, the financial agreement was welcomed, uh, but uh, there was, in the aftermath of uh, the uh, tripartite agreement, there's rather little contact between the Irish Free State government and the Northern Ireland government. And, and this is rather important, anti-treaty Sinn Féin, uh, anti-treaty IRA, in other words, de Valera's uh, political people and the uh, the uh, uh, underground uh, pro you know anti treaty uh, uh, IRA they were uh, they they gained from the outcome uh, there was a boost to the IRA a lot of finger pointing uh, on the part of uh, IRA and uh, anti-treaty uh, Sinn Féiners uh, to the uh, government, the Cosgrave government, uh, along the lines of, uh, uh, we told you that the treaty would be uh, bring ill, certainly not any, any positive uh, outcome, uh, especially on the uh, question of Northern Ireland. <laughs> Now, uh, enough uh, with uh, some of the uh, challenges that uh, uh, had uh, a uh, 
law, law and order uh, element, uh, 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 a uh, relationship uh, and connection to uh, Northern Ireland and the British government. Uh, what about ec the economy under the uh, under Cosgrave? The Cosgrave government was conservative and protectionist in its early uh, years, economically, policy-wise. <clears throat> when I say conservative, how conservative was it? Um, 1925, in order to balance the budget, the Cosgrave administration removed a whole week of payment from old age pensions. <coughs> uh, but never, nevertheless, uh, the uh, government did create a strong civil service. Uh, but was economic recovery occurring? Uh, <clears throat> as the decade unfolded, employment uh, was a major problem, uh, or lack of employment. <clears throat> uh, associated with it was the lack of, uh, of uh, modern power, electricity, for example, <clears throat> a shortage of investment, capital. Uh, electricity was scarce. <coughs> uh, where it existed, it, it was provided by proper, privately owned uh, generating stations. But then there developed a remarkable uh, scheme, the so-called so Shannon scheme, to expand dramatically uh, the uh, provision of electricity. Uh, the scheme was the brainchild of Dr. T.A. McLaughlin. It was promoted by Joe McGrath. There's considerable opposition to it on the grounds of expense. Uh, indeed, it, uh, the total cost was about five million pounds, uh, and uh, what was the Shannon scheme? It was to uh, harness uh, the water power of the Shannon River to generate power, hydroelectric power. Uh, now, Joe uh, McGrath, be, you know, having uh, resigned uh, from the uh, cabinet, uh, he becomes director of labor at Shannon uh, and uh, uh, for four years, four years it took to create uh, the uh, structure uh, of uh, the uh, Shannon scheme. Uh, there were 4,000 uh, Irish uh, workers uh, receiving a decent, uh, decent uh, weekly wage. Now, 1927, an electricity uh, supply board was set up to administer uh, the uh, operation uh, and the payment for uh, the, the uh, electricity uh, generated by the, uh, uh, in the, the, the Shannon scheme. Uh, the Shannon scheme is in operation by October of 1929, okay. Uh, also uh, associated <coughs> with uh, the uh, 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 with the the uh, uh, Cosgrave government is the foundation. Uh, of the uh, Irish uh, hospital sweepstake in 1930. Joe McGrath was the principal founder here. Uh, this was a, a bas basically, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a gambling 
uh, operation. You'd buy uh, tickets uh, on a key uh, horse race, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the prize would be a massive uh, lump sum. Um, sweepstakes tickets were not just sold in uh, 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 in Ireland, they were sold uh, <laughs> worldwide. And you find in your uh, supplementary packet uh, uh, an article in the Providence Sunday Journal, 1970, entitled How the, How the Irish Sweepstakes uh, Got uh, uh, started, um, and uh, the, uh, the tickets were sold illegally throughout the United States, uh, very often by uh, very proper Irish immigrant uh, ladies. Uh, interestingly enough, the first winner uh, was Emilio Scala, born to a family of 14, uh, in Isola de Lira, near the Bay of Naples, he ran away when he was 12 years old, old to Rome and moved to London, pushed a wagon selling ice cream, bought a cafe in Battersby, bought a sweepstake ticket for a dollar fifty, uh, the equivalent of a dollar fifty. Uh, he won. Uh, the equivalent of one million seventy thousand one hundred and seventy two uh, dollars for his dollar fifty investment. Uh, uh, so the Irish, uh, the Irish sweepstakes. Uh, uh, what did the money go to? It go to it went to the modernization of uh, Irish hospitals. Uh, the outcome was that Ireland uh, over time would have one of the finest hospital systems in the world, in the world. Now also, the government promoted an economic recovery in agriculture uh, in uh, 1923, uh, as Gibney notes, uh, uh, the Land Act completed the pros process of compulsory land purchase and uh, a sizable amount of land was uh, redistributed uh, to Irish uh, farmers. Uh, the government also set standards in farm produce and created a sugar beet uh, industry uh, centered at uh, Carlo and I believe at uh, June, County Galway. Uh, sugar beets, uh, in other words, you produce sugar uh, from from sugar beets. Uh, in 1927, the Agricultural Credit uh, Corporation uh, was established, and it did provide uh, loans for improvement uh, on farms. But something else happened uh, as the decade uh, uh, moved into its second half. 1926-1927, we have the founding of Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil. Uh, after his relief from jail, jail in July uh, of 1924, Di Valera, excuse me, uh, led uh, anti-treaty Sinn Féin in non-attendance uh, at Doyle Eretz, so, so he continues to lead uh, Sinn Féin, uh, and they continue to boycott uh, Dale, uh, Doyle Aaron. But late 1925, there occurred a split in Sinn Féin. De Valera implied that he would enter the Doyle Aaron if the oath of allegiance. Uh, were uh, uh, it removed, uh, and he acted uh, to solidify the split. In March of 1926, De Valera resigned as president of Sinn Féin, 
And in May of 1926, he and his uh, associates, who probably constituted a majority of, Sinn, of the Sinn Féin uh, uh, party, they founded Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil. Uh, what's the uh, trans English translation of Fianna Fáil? Uh, Fianna Warriors. Warriors of Destiny, Fianna Fáil. Uh, the uh, name wasn't exactly new, the volunteers during the struggle for independence against uh, the British uh, had been called uh, Fianna Fall. What were the aims of the Fianna Fall power? To secure, uh, number one, secure a United uh, Irish uh, uh, Republic. Uh, two, to restore the Irish language. Three, to advance a social system based on equal opportunity. Uh, four, to continue land redistribution. Uh, and fifthly, uh, very much in the mold of Arthur Griffith, uh, to establish Irish self-sufficiency. In November of 1926, uh, Fianna Fáil uh, held its first Ard Fesh, in other words, party convention, A R D F H E I S. De Valera was elected president. Uh, following him, there were some key figures in what had been Sinn Fein. Uh, O'Kelly, Frank Aiken, remember Aiken? Aiken had headed up the uh, uh, IRA. Uh, in the uh, 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 last phases of the uh, Civil War, James Ryan, Sean Lamas, good French name, descended a French uh, immigrant to Ireland in the early uh, 19th century, Sean Lamas, uh, who would go on to become the Taysak, or Prime Minister of Ireland, uh, uh, following De Valera uh, in uh, 1959. Now, Gen June of 1927, there was a general election uh, to the Doyle. De Valera's party fighting uh, on the oath, removing it. Uh, and committed to establishing a republic, won 44 states, uh, 44 seats, I should say. Uh, Cosgrave's party, Commander Gale, won 47 seats. The Labour Party won 22 seats. Independence, 14. Uh, the Farmers, uh, 11. Now, uh, you notice a, a, a significant drop in Commander Gale. Uh, if the Commander Gale could pick up uh, votes uh, from uh, labor or independents or farmers, uh, they'd be fine. Uh, on the other hand, if De Valera picked up uh, votes uh, from uh, labor, independence, farmers. Uh, De Valera's party, Fianna Fáil, could, could establish the government. But De Valera and Fianna Fáil, uh, the members uh, elected to the door, refused to take the oath. And the matter might have continued, the stalemate might have continued uh, there. But then, uh, 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 on uh, uh, July 10th, 1927, tragedy, July 10th, a Sunday, he's on his way to Mass, 
and he's assassinated by three uh, members of the IRA. Who am I really speaking of? Kevin O'Higgins, uh, July 10, 1927. He had been uh, uh, hated uh, by uh, the IRA, especially for his action as uh, a Home Affairs Minister and Vice uh, uh, President of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, Cosgrave government. Um, how would the Cosgrave government respond to uh, O'Higgins' uh, assassination? Uh, well, with a uh, Public Safety Act, and what's a Public Safety Act o o always meant uh, uh, something of a curtailing of uh, uh, civil liberties. But far more important, the Doyle, Cosgraves Doyle, passed the Electoral Amendment uh, Act, uh, and, and it really put the squeeze uh, on uh, 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 on Diva Lyra and uh, Fina Fall. I'm going to let you read in the Gibney book what exactly the uh, public, uh, the Electoral Amendment Act uh, provided for. But again, it's designed to end uh, Fina Fall's unwillingness to take their seats in the Doyle. Uh, and it worked. August 10, uh, D. Valera went in, took the oath, in other words, signed the uh, document, uh, but uh, dismissed it as an empty political formula. Um, and so now, D. Valera and Fina Fall are on, uh, on the verge of becoming a powerful electoral governmental force that would be seen, uh, for example, in the general election of uh, September of 1927. What were the results? Cosgrave's party did win 67 seats, but Fina Fall that had won 44 seats in June of 27 and September of 27, won 57 seats. Whoa! Uh, and uh, there was a distinctive uh, uh, reduction in the number of seats, uh, won by Labor, 13, uh, won six farmers, 12 independents. Uh, one factor I might add was that uh, uh, both Commander Gale and Fina Fall uh, had uh, more uh, financial resources uh, to uh, wage a, uh, a successful campaign. Uh, in fact, uh, Fina Fall from the beginning developed a machinery of constituency organization through local kumans, in other words, local branches. Uh, and uh, they raised money through those local branches. Uh, something else that would uh, uh, contribute uh, to a victory for uh, Fina Fall in 1932. In 1931, they had the resources to establish uh, a major Irish newspaper. It would be owned by the, and uh, run by the De Valeras, the Irish Press, the Irish Press. I'll have more to uh, say about the election that brought De Valera to power in 1932, 
But I do want to uh, uh, mention uh, uh, the issue of the Irish Free State as the Restless Dominion. There's a, a fine book by uh, Professor Hastings, uh, professor at Queen's uh, University, Belfast. He looks at the foreign policy uh, of the uh, Irish Free State. Uh, it involved what? Well, the Free State was involved uh, in the uh, process of the evolution of the British Commonwealth that would bring uh, even more sovereignty to the dominions, uh, especially. In other words, to the Irish Free State, to Canada, to Australia, uh, to New Zealand, to the uh, Union uh, of South Africa. Um, the Free State played an active role in imperial conferences. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, in 1927 uh, the Oath of Allegiance, uh, for example in, in Ireland, had become an empty formula, to be sure. Uh, and in fact, the Free State had earlier acted as a sovereign independent state, uh, much to the chagrin of the uh, uh, British government. They registered the Treaty of 1921 with the League of Nations at Geneva in 1924. The capstone, by the way, of this evolution uh, of uh, the Commonwealth towards greater uh, autonomy, indeed uh, virtual independence uh, for the Dominions, uh, was the Statute of Westminster of December 11, 1931, uh, it uh, prescribed a co-equal relationship uh, between the Dominions and the United Kingdom. Uh, and again, it was the outcome of lengthy discussions that took place uh, at Imperial Conferences. Uh, in 1926, Kevin O'Hagan's played a prominent role in the Imperial Conference of that year. Uh, 1921, 19, uh, 29, 1930. At those two imperial conferences, O'Higgins, of course, was uh, dead, but Patrick uh, McGilligan, who was the chief Irish delegate, uh, he joined with the uh, uh, delegates from the other do dominions to further uh, the, uh, the uh, virtual independence of the uh, dominions. Uh, Finally, it should be noted that uh, on March 10th, 1931, uh, you know, acting again uh, as asserting its, its uh, growing uh, independence, the Irish Free State uh, created its own great seal. Okay. So, 1931 becomes 1932. Uh, in that year, there was a, a general election to the Doyle. Uh, the sum and substance of the uh, election was uh, the defeat of uh, Cosgrave's government, Commander Gale. Let's look at the, uh, the results. Fianna Fáil got 72 seats. Uh, Kuman Nagel, 57 seats, Cosgrave's party. Labour, 7 seats. Now, all Fianna Fáil needed were the seven seats of the Labour government. 
They delivered their seats to De Valera's uh, Pina Paul party uh, and, and De Valera uh, now assumed and his party, Pina Paul, assumed uh, in coalition with uh, a few laborites assumed control of the government of the Irish uh, Free State. Now, one of the reasons for the defeat of Commander Gale, uh, one was certainly the appearance of Fianna Fáil uh, in the Doyle era in 1927 as a vital opposition uh, party. Secondly, the great economic depression <clears throat> that had swept the world uh, from its inception in uh, 1929, the end of 29, in the United States. Also a factor that worked against <clears throat> Cosgrave's government. A public safety bill of October of 1931. <clears throat> it became law <clears throat> as Constitution Amendment Number 17 Act. It set up military tribunals to try political offenses. And that infuriated IRA. And the IRA uh, that uh, was totally committed to establishing an Irish Republic uh, signed on to uh, supported uh, uh, De Valera's party, Fianna Fáil. It should be noted, uh, too, that the IRA was moving to the left. Uh, uh, the, uh, oh, here's, a, I'm, I'm looking, by the way, at the Irish Free State uh, Passport, 1930. Um, the picture of uh, Patrick McGilligan, Minister for External Affairs of the Irish Free State. Uh, uh, next. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, IRA was moving to the left. Uh, major figure would be Peter O'Donnell, Peter O'Donnell. Uh, indeed, an IRA Congress <clears throat> uh, assembled in Dublin in uh, September uh, 26, 27, 1931, was socialist in its party. <clears throat> There's other Republican activism on Flobach, the newspaper uh, under Frank uh, Ryan, <clears throat> uh, was... Uh, rabidly anti uh, uh, Kumandigeo. Uh, Sa Erie, Free Island was uh, uh, both Republican and Socialist in tenure. <clears throat> and also <clears throat> there was uh, illegal drilling and shooting taking place and that was one of the reasons why uh, the <clears throat> The uh, country government set up the military uh, tribunals. Finally, in early 1932, the government decided to prosecute uh, the Irish press. Uh, they brought uh, the Irish press, the newspaper, before the uh, tribunal, and there was, there was an, uh, a lot of resent resentment at this uh, governmental infer interference in the free, in a free press. Uh, so, De Valera's uh, party would uh, uh, take power in early 1932. <clears throat> the, as the quotation indicates at the beginning uh, of your outline <clears throat> from John Murphy, and his history of Ireland. Uh, the Cosgrave government, the leaders of Commander Gale, made no effort 
to <clears throat> prevent a peaceful transition to uh, a uh, government made up of folks who had fought against the Cosgrave government uh, in the Civil War. Finally, <clears throat> on your outline here, I indicate that the uh, Cosgrave government certainly did achieve much. It brought order to the Irish Free State. It established the Free State as an internationally recognized independent state. Uh, and it established, uh, thirdly, a solid tradition of democratic constitutional government backed by efficient, dedicated civil service. No small uh, achievement. Uh, uh, the, uh, I believe that's the end, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> again, I'm signing off. Uh, I want to hear <clears throat> from each of you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Moore, McCarthy, um, and let's see, and uh, where, where's our man, uh, <clears throat> uh, J Jimmy. Uh, uh, Nichols, um, and uh, I want to know from Jimmy uh, what the status of his uh, uh, Gibney book, uh, and uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Tanisha, uh, the same as with uh, all the three. Uh, I want to know whether you and they uh, have uh, access to uh, Ernie O'Malley's memoir, Army Without Banners, uh, and uh, uh, Henry Patterson's Ireland Since 1939. Again, uh, au revoir. Uh, or as the Italians might say, uh, ciao, a scholar who won the Irish sweepstake would certainly say ciao. Uh, uh, I look forward to uh, receiving and, uh, and uh, grading uh, your uh, uh, assignment papers uh, and uh, uh, take care. Uh, I wish each of you security, peace, uh, and to especially take care of your, your siblings and more than anything, your uh, parents, uh, your grandparents, your elders. God bless you all.